All right, hello everybody and welcome to a webinar hosted by CCAST, the or Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox. Uh, my name is Anna Weinberg and I am the Climate and Drought Adaptation Community of Practice Coordinator of CCAST. I joined CCAST over a year and a half ago um, and work out of the University of Arizona based in Tucson. CCAST is intended to support landscape scale conservation and restoration by enhancing issue-based peer-to-peer knowledge exchange through the development of case studies, workshops, and webinars like today's. We use CCAST case studies as a foundation for our communities of practice uh, to address drought and climate adaptation, grassland restoration, and introduce aquatic species. If you'd like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, feel free to email myself or Genevieve Johnson directly, um, and Genevieve will drop those emails in the chat. Today, we are hosting a presentation from Paul Tashin and Casey Ish about their work implementing conservation and resiliency actions in the agroecosystem of the Middle Rio Grande Basin. Paul is Audubon, New Mexico's freshwater conservation director. Before Audubon, he worked as a hydrologist for the US Fish and Wildlife Service Southwestern region for 26 years. His expertise includes water management and protection for wildlife, river restoration, water law, and wetland workshop coordination. He was also the founder and coordinator of the Bosque Hydrology Group, an interagency, interuniversity think tank focused on the physical restoration of the middle Rio Grande. And Casey Ish was born and raised in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and has been with the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District since the fall of 2019. He is a water resources specialist and oversees several grant funded programs within the district's conservation program. A graduate from the University of New Mexico, he received a BLA in freshwater conservation and management and recently completed his master's degree at the University of New Mexico School of Law and Natural Resource and Water Law. A final reminder before I turn it over to our speakers, if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat and I will relay them afterwards during our question and answer section. With that, Paul and Casey, we are ready for you. Great, uh, thank you so much, Anna, and big thanks to CCAST for doing this stuff. You guys are really doing some wonderful work at connecting the dots and, and looking at the big scale. Um, so I wanted to talk today about some uh, partnership work between the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, which is MRGCD, and Audubon. And, I, and I'm going to focus this talk on what, what I'm going to call the, we'll call it the slider reach of the middle Rio Grande, and I'll show you where that is in a bit. So I'm going, to I'm going to start with an overview of the reach and its habitat, and then scale into the components of the partnership. And this will be followed by Casey from the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, who will discuss the con conservation program in greater detail. So just to orient ourselves, uh, this is the Rio Grande Basin, headwaters in Colorado, uh, flowing down to the Gulf in Texas at Brownsville, 1,900 miles in length. The, what we in New Mexico call our middle Rio Grande, of course, if you're in, in Texas, um, it's a different place. But for us, our middle Rio Grande is 190 river miles from Cochise Reservoir to Elephant Butte Reservoir. And it's been the area of very uh, intensive uh, conservation efforts over the last three decades. The nestled within the middle Rio Grande, the middle of the middle Rio Grande, if you will, is the Isleta Reach. And on this map, you can see at the, at the top of it is Cochita Reservoir and then Jemez Reservoir, Albuquerque, Berlin, Socorro. Um, and so the, the Isleta Reach, we're defining as the Isleta Reach, is from the south boundary of the Pueblo of Isleta to San Acacia. It's 53 river miles in length. So it's about 3% of the entire length of the Rio Grande. So this is what I'm, I'm gonna start out with, just a discussion about the historic hydroecology and the modern, just to put us into the context of what I think is special about this reach. When I think about the Rio Grande and the middle Rio Grande in particular, I think about snowpack and snowpack and snowpack runoff as being the primary driver to the ecology of this river. This is a wonderful picture from the videographer, Christy Bodie, who has done stuff for Seacast as well and great does great work. Just want to put a plug in for Christy here. So here's the hydrograph. Okay, again, so a hydrograph, January 1st on the x-axis to December 31st, the, the, the year. 
and then flow from zero to 20,000 cubic feet per second. This is from 1920. This is the San Marcial gauge at the southern end of the middle Rio Grande, a very important gauge just upstream of Alpha Butte Reservoir. And what you note here is come uh, late April, early May, the flows increase exponentially. And this is the spring snowmelt pulse. This pulse, if you look at the, um, this is a picture from 1920 near Albuquerque, what the Rio Grande looked like back then. Um, and this pulse drove this system historically. It's what the native plants and animals that we're largely trying to conserve today are very much keyed into. The silvery minnow spawns on the upswing of the, of the spring pulse. Cottonwood seeds uh, seed themselves on sandbars, freshly scoured sandbars on the downswing side of it. And there's other, just, just the predominant ecological driver. So this is the middle Rio Grande in the 20. Uh, it was referred to as a, you know, being a mile wide and an inch deep in a very dynamic system where stuff was shifting around, wetlands were shifting around, a new floodplain was being created, old floodplain being uh, eroded um, and habitat constantly regenerating itself in the system driven by these large floods. This is what the Rio Grande looks like in the Asada Reach today. So it's very different looking, right? So it's a miniature version, if that. What to me is remarkable about the middle Rio Grande is despite all these very dramatic changes, there is still a considerable amount of ecological function remaining in the system. And I think that one indication of this are the endangered species, these species that we are uh, that are very much part of the management of the system. Um, and two of these species that you talk about here are the silvery minnow and the southwestern male flycatcher. So, so you know, the silvery minnow used to be the predominant minnow from about Espanol all the way down to the Gulf. And there was a similar, uh, you know, subspecies on the Pecos as well. It's only remaining in the middle of the Grande today. And it's, it, it is keyed in, like I said, to the spring pulse, an active sand bed and a connected floodplain. There's something about this reach that still has those components in this miniature version that are still happening enough today where this species is still around. Uh, the flycatcher, more widespread than the minnow in terms of geographic extent, but it's tied into wild riparian wetlands and an active floodplain dynamics. So again, it's an indication that something is working in this reach. And I would say that largely the way I look at it, this is the, the hydrograph that I showed you before in blue in the background, and then in the 1950s in pink and 19, late 1990s in yellow. Um, because the upstream main stem reservoir on the middle Rio Grande and on the Rio Grande in New Mexico, the primary main stem one, not including the Chama, um, that reservoir is a flood control reservoir, Coach D, inflows basically passes outflows up to a certain point. Um, so this pulse, the, the natural hydrograph heartbeat is still making it through and is still very much a part of the system. So I've been working in this system for 30 years. And, um, and, and I started back as a young tyke um, in the early 90s when this Bosque Biological Management Plan was, was produced. And this was, uh, on the left here is Cliff Crawford, a, a, a now deceased uh, uh, professor who was a mentor to all of us and just a wonderful person um, and helped construct this plan. Um, and, and I want to just point back to this because the river was very different back then when this came out. Um, this is a aerial photograph of the Isleta Reach from the 90s. And what you see here are very straight banks. Um, this is by design. This width, if you measure it, is going to be Mas or Menas 600 feet. It's the Rio Grande project design for conveyance of the river. Um, and the, the, the forested area, the bosque, is this remnant forest that was not, uh, not an active forest. This is very concerning at this time, and this is a lot of what the Bosque Biological Management Plan was about, is that there really wasn't active regeneration going on of cottonwood, willow, woody vegetation. So the banks are held in place by jetty jacks. Um, you know, these things are entirely along both banks holding that in place. Um, these Normandy style jacks that lock the banks in place and sediment deposits behind them. And then the, the floodplain, quote unquote, is actually functioned more of a terrace or really didn't receive floodwaters. And this is this, this, this legacy cottonwood willow forest, beautiful, but concerning because there wasn't any young regeneration going on. And this is 
uh, near Albuquerque. The example this forest often referred to as the class of 41 because a lot of the trees date back to a 1941-42 El Nino year were one of the last big floods in the valley. So here it is again in the 90s. Here's the river today. And this is, to me, is a miraculous story that I like to tell over and over again. The river has formed, narrowed, it, narrowed because of drought, narrowed because of the changes in the hydrology and the sediment load, and is forming bars, vegetated bars and islands that are now the active floodplain. So it's basically developed an inset floodplain system. And what's even more promising about this system is that it's predominantly native vegetation. And, and this is over 50 miles. And, it, and we see pieces of this outside these letter reach as well in Albuquerque and down in Socorro. It really, for, for, for different reasons, really shows up in the Isleta Reach. Um, and so it's, here's cottonwood willow trees regenerated there. Uh, and then here's a really nice uh, view from a co coworker of mine, I'll mention more in a little bit, Quantina Martin, um, of uh, the lower part of the Isleta Reach. And you see this inset terrace. So these Russian olive trees that are on the banks here, that's that 600 foot wide width. And here's this inset floodplain that the river has developed, largely while we were looking the other way. Um, and it's predominantly native vegetation. What's even more sort of intriguing about this is that the bird, the Southwestern willow flycatcher, which was, you know, 10 years ago, the predominant bucket of birds were nesting down the headwaters of Elephant Butte. Uh, there are bits and pieces up and down the river where they showed up, Balski del Apache and a few other places. But now the, in the past three years, the birds have moved into this habitat. So it's active. And so that's again saying something, uh, something is positive happening here. And I will say that this has happened during drought. So here's the hydrograph from a gauge in the Isleta Reach from 2003 to 2020. These high flow peaks are that spring pulse that are sort of making it through. But in the last 10 years, there's been, there's been spring pulses, but there's also been drier conditions. So a lot to unpack there and a lot that I don't know, fully understand, uh, but it's to me kind of miraculous um, and uh, a positive story amongst all the, the, the non-positive drought stories that we hear a lot of. Um, so I'm gonna shift gear here to queue up Casey. And what I wanted to talk about is um, this partnership that uh, Audubon Southwest has developed with uh, the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. And I just want to make the point that the, the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy, MRGCD, has been doing uh, ecosystem stewardship projects since the inception of the Bosque Biological Management Plan in the early 1990s. So they've been super active. Audubon, we've been working in the Middle Rio Grande probably since the early 2000s. Uh, you know, I, I, in a former life, I worked on it at Fish and Wildlife Service, but there's there's, there's continuity here. I just wanted to give a shout out that this is in, a lot of this stuff are just pieces of continuing past efforts. Uh, but I want to talk about three arms of the current um, the current partnership to queue up Casey here. And I want to talk about our San Juan Chama water leases. San Juan Chama is Colorado River water. Um, and we've been leasing this water and bringing it back to the river in partnership with the Conservancy District. I want to talk about the um, MRDCD's conserv conservation program. And then I'll finish by talking about the Isleta Reach Stewardship Association. So here's a bird's eye view of the Isleta Reach. And I call this an agro ecosystem. I really love that term, terminology. Here's the river that we talked, that I just discussed and the bars and the islands that are forming and the cool river stuff. But also outside this is this whole former floodplain, which is the farmland of the Middle Rio. And this former flood floodplain <laughs> receives water through the irrigation system and flooding, flood irrigation is the predominant irrigation style. So it's like water on the floodplain. And it, if you're a crane or a crow flying over this, you don't say like, oh, there's a river and there's a farmland. It's like one ecosystem in its entirety in the modern. Um, it's changed, it's a novel ecosystem, but it's a it's pretty, re pretty remarkable and amazing ecosystem at that. So it's an agro ecosystem. The farmland and the ditches are really a part of this ecosystem and they're not separate. It's not like the irrigation districts or ditches are separate from the river ecosystem. And to bring that home, here's a schematic of the, uh, the ditch system of the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. You can get this online through the Bureau of Reclamation's website, the awards website. Um, and what this has here 
in this schematic is different diversions and then returns. And these little arrows are all the returns. These returns were developed to uh, provide relief valves for the system when storms would sit in over the farm fields. They're called outfalls, irrigation outfalls. And so there's these irrigation outfalls throughout the system. And this is what an outfall looks like in the Isleta Reach, where there's islands across one of these vegetated bars. If you follow this up to, into the Bosque trees, up towards the upper left part of this photo, you would eventually, within 100 yards, hit an irrigation ditch where there's actually a diversion there. Just to give you, so this is like water being diverted to the river. This is an outfall called the Los Chavas outfall, where a lot of work has been done for cons conserving uh, the species. And initially, what was done with all these outfalls was to get water to the river to use efficiently push water back to the river. Um, so it's, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, like a string of pearls, but to keep it flowing. And this is an example from 2018, where actually leased water from Audubon was uh, uh, managed by the Conservancy District to keep the river whole through that dry year. So just to summarize, this is the one text heavy slide I have, so pardon me, but just some of this work just, and this is the, 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 um, the CCAST has a, 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 a article about this or a web article about the, our work here, but we've been the primary NGO uh, leasing water. The Bureau of Reclamation has leased a lot of the San Juan Chama water, but we're sort of an NGO. And I, I believe that that provides resiliency, having different buckets of water in the system. Um, it started in 2016 with these uh, partnership with the Middle Rio Grande Pueblos. And then 2018, 2019, 20, and 21, uh, we leased water. We have funding, just so you know, from Bonneville Environmental Foundation, um, and it's funding through Facebook. But we have funding through 2000, 2027, and that's really helpful to have that long-term funding so it's not year to year. In 2018, we brought close to 1,000 acre feet of water and this, just to give you a sense of the scale, this that provided one month of flows during the driest part of the year when the river was going dry to keep connectivity for eight, 38 miles of the Rio Grande. Um, so it's, and it's again, it's like making this small amounts of water go a long way by using this irrigation system. In 2020, we brought 530 acres of water to the Isleta Reach. Uh, and so this was one month of flow and 20 miles. Um, it was commingled with some other water which Casey will talk about. And so in 2021, we released close to 500 acre feet and brought it to the, the directly to, and, and Casey will talk about this, Emergency DD is developing its own environmental water leasing program. And what we're doing here is we are bringing this water, uh, commingling it with these other leased water to get the most effective management of the system. And one thing that the Audubon water provides that the leased water from the farm leased water, which we'll hear more about, uh, is storage. We, we were able to store it. So we can actually, we actually didn't release about 170 acre feet last year and held on to it for this year. Um, so it's part of the resiliency strategy um, moving forward. Um, so this all fits into, in case we'll talk more about this, the MRDCD's conservation program. This is a program that is uh, managed and administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, funded through the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and just a real nice cartoon that I like that Casey shows a lot is this three arms of the program, sustainable agriculture, ecosystem health and species conservation, and water management in Rio Grande compact compliance. So this, I, these things are all being managed together. And I would even say for the middle Rio Grande, that farming and river are tied together. If the farms go, the river goes, just because the way those outfalls work and the way the system is managed. So part of our work is to provide assistance to the Conservancy District, technical assistance is part of that conservation program. And here we have Amy Erickson and Quantina Martin from Audubon. Quantina is a drone pilot um, and she um, has provided, as well as a hydrologist, provided a lot of technical expertise to assist with this program. And just a couple examples of this. Um, here's some temperature monitoring that Quantina did of that same outfall I showed you a picture of before. For the Rio Grande Silvery Minnow, 86 degrees Fahrenheit is sort of a threshold. If you go above that, the fish starts cooking and getting stressed out, and far above that, it can't survive. So it's a threshold 
uh, threshold temperature. What Contina has showed throughout some temperature, and this is just sort of snapshots of some of the work being done, has showed that the temperature of his outfall, in this case, was 73 degrees when the river upstream was 93 degrees, so above it. So the outfall was providing thermal refugium for the minnow. And actually, we've, we've sampled in here, or, or SWICA has, um, they have sampled in this outfall and found minnows holding up there in refuge during the dry part. So it's some um, exciting information. And then uh, Quentin has also provided a lot of expertise in terms of drone imagery for restoration. Here at that very site was a, a large backwater that was constructed to provide backwater habitat during higher flows uh, for spawning of the minnow in the springtime. And then finally, uh, the other uh, arm of our partnership with the Conservancy District in trying to work through these uh, conservation of the Middle River Grande is this is Slater Reach Stewardship Association. It's the citizen agency stewardship group. And this just started in 2019, um, been funded through the Water Smart Cooperative Watershed and Management Program, Bureau Reclamations Program. We actually got a second one of these grants this year for continuation of the group. And I invite you to visit our hub. Um, Anna will put this in the, the chat, this uh, <coughs> hub link, where we have a lot of information about the, this reach. A lot of these documents that I've referenced so far today are in that, are, are available online there, as well as maps and historic maps and modern maps and stuff. So I uh, invite you to that. Uh, we've developed a conceptual stewardship plan, uh, which sort of lays out the, uh, the framework for the reach, um, and then also points towards what stewardship activities a community group um, can be doing to help uh, uh, conserve and steward the habitat. And we've been holding these, just beginning to do this sort of stuff, but holding these, you know, it's hard to develop this during COVID, but we're finally doing this. Uh, like I said, trash pickup day, uh, planning days. Uh, this is uh, one of these trash pickup days um, at a site. And at this site, uh, here's Casey, your next speaker, who is at, sitting at a, um, that outfall control structure that's dumping into that outfall I showed you at Los Chavez and discussing the conservation program with the citizens involved in this uh, stewardship association. So with that, I will bounce it to Casey. Thanks, Paul, as always, um, very thorough. So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Casey Ish. I'm a water resources specialist with the MRGCD here. I'll go ahead and pull my screen up and we can get started. All right. Everybody able to see that? Paul, you can just give me a nod if you can see that. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so yeah, kind of dialing in what Paul said to uh, focus a little bit more on what the MRGCD is doing on a, on a day in day out basis through the conservation program to support sustainable agriculture um, and ecosystem uh, services and health and uh, as well as our, our compact compliance. And like Paul alluded to, we pretty much see those all as one, one mission that's you know, supported by all these different efforts. Um, they, they really kind of complement each other and without one, you really can't accomplish the other. So an introduction to the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District um, created in 1923 to provide uh, flood protection, drainage from swamplands and irrigation water to constituents uh, within the Middle Rio Grande Valley. Uh, today, the MRGCD is responsible for providing irrigation water to approximately 60,000 acres uh, within that uh, area. Um, that's drastically down from what we used to provide. We've seen a lot of development in the middle of Rio Grande and uh, a lot of movement of water uh, that used to be applied to that uh, floodplain uh, has been moved to industry, been moved to municipal use. Um, so that's a, a piece of the puzzle that needs to be considered uh, when we talk about um, sustainable river management is, is how do we maintain this really valuable piece of the puzzle, which is um, flood irrigation on the, on the floodplain outside of the levees. Uh, we currently operate four different diversions um, throughout the Middle Valley, starting at the north is Cochiti, Angostura, then is Letta, uh, which supplies water to the Isleta Reach, obviously. 
um, and then the Santa Kasha diversion, which is our southernmost diversion, which supports uh, Sapporo and some sites south of there. So those are our four main diversions onto the river. And as Paul noted, we have a number of outfall returns uh, that throughout the course of, of returns to the river provide that stream of pearl uh, infusion of water. We do have uh, areas of infusion that support the river during times of drying. Uh, um, main stem flows are not enough to sustain uh, fish populations. So the MRGCD also owns and manages approximately 30,000 acres of bosque, uh, which is the really complex and, and beautiful riparian forest that um, adjoins the river on either side. And the Isleta Reach is a, a great example of, um, of how that bosque is kind of adapted um, for a number of different reasons, but has kind of developed this, this own um, very special and, and novel um, texture and composition that is really interesting for anyone who's, who's trying to understand what the future of um, riparian management is going to be in, in this valley moving forward into the future. Uh, and finally, uh, just a note on the, the scale and complexity of the MRGCD's infrastructure. We um, maintain and manage over 1,200 miles of, of canal uh, just between Cochiti and Socorro. So if you remember Paul's, one of his initial slides, you know, the, the Rio Grande in total is about 1,900 miles long. And within our tiny little stretch of the river, uh, the MRGC is, is very long and very uh, narrow when it comes to our own facilities. So conservation program overview. Um, what we do here at the, at the conservation program is really take those, those three core pillars of sustainable agriculture, um, species resiliency and, and ecosystem, and compact delivery and compliance. And we try and find ways to make all three of those work hand in hand, day in and day out. Uh, so that's a combination of enhancing on-farm efficiency um, to create a, a net conservation of water in, in our own infrastructure, um, finding unique ways to get water back to the river using infrastructure that we already have in place, such as our outfalls, as well as looking for new locations to um, make those infusions at, at strategic locations. Uh, and then of course, you know, going after funding. Um, the program that we have right now would not be possible without the help and support of uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Bureau of Reclamation that have made this initial pilot uh, possible. So that's a big piece of the puzzle. You can have all the, all the ideas in the world, but without adequate funding, um, it's really hard to do this stuff uh, in the field and having partners such as Audubon, it, it really helps. So a look at kind of the farm side of what the conservation program is, is doing to improve uh, water conservation in our own facilities. If you look at that image on the right, uh, it's a farm delivery pad. And it's not really a, a novel um, piece of infrastructure, but it's a piece that has been missing from uh, the MRGCD's view for a long time because for the longest time the MRGCD's policy was we deliver water to, to the turnout, right, to the farmer. And after it crosses that fence line and leaves our facility, uh, how they apply that water and, and what that efficiency looks like is, is not really up to us anymore. Um, and we just don't really have the luxury of that anymore. Uh, we live in a, a time where water is becoming more and more scarce and, and how we manage it on a day-to-day -day basis is becoming more and more critical. So we are starting to provide resources for farmers to help take um, more efficient approaches to flood irrigation. So the farm delivery pad that you see there on the right is a very simple structure that takes uh, what would normally be a very erosive volume of water uh, through a large diameter uh, turnout pipe and evenly spreads that water across the field at, at a corner um, so that that farmer can irrigate quickly and efficiently without cavitation at the corner. Um, we're seeing dramatic improvements in uh, the time to irrigate. This particular field is located in a pecan orchard uh, here in Albuquerque. Prior to the installation of that farm delivery pad, it would take that two acre pecan field um, or orchard anywhere from four to five hours to water. And uh, 
with this increased turnout, we're seeing a, a completed irrigation in about 45 minutes. And what that translates to is, um, you know, if you think about the, the application of water in, in acre inches, every time you make that delivery, uh, we're seeing a more consistent and steady uh, and appropriate application of water every time we open up that turnout to the farmer. And that's resulting in a, a net increase in water available in the system. Um, if you zoom out slightly to our own infrastructure, you can imagine the, the facility that's providing water to that farm delivery pad. Uh, another structure that we're looking to build a lot of is on the left. That's the long crested weir. Uh, these are very common in a lot of different irrigation districts around the West. Um, we've been working diligently to try and install these at strategic locations within our own facilities over the last couple of years. And what they really do is maintain a stable uh, level control for efficient irrigation so that you can have multiple irrigators uh, watering at the same time in a particular stretch of, of a canal. Um, and because of the, the long shape, you're not, um, you're not minimizing the amount of water that can bypass or pass over the top of that canal uh, and, and thus risk you know, flooding or, or a breach of the canal. So it provides for an extremely efficient um, source of water for those turnouts to then water quickly. And it also provides uh, a great opportunity to measure inflow and outflow inside of the facility. So, uh, you know, we say around here, you can't, you can't manage what you can't measure. So we've been working really hard to increase our ability to measure water as it moves through our facility. That then informs our decision-making um, when we, when we deliver water back to the river. So you can now zoom out uh, even further in the MRGC's infrastructure and start to apply these conservation strategies to um, what we're talking about here today, right? Which is strategic partnerships to support agriculture and riparian habitat. Um, Paul's already brought up that the MRGCD has a series of outfalls that return water back to the river. Um, these are areas that are already established and already built out. And all we're trying to do inside the conservation program with these is increase um, our ability to automate, our ability to deliver, and our ability to measure uh, water to these outfall sites. And the reason we need all three of those components is that when we uh, start a leasing program or work with a partner like Audubon to make those deliveries of water uh, to these sites, we really need to know what we're delivering when we're delivering. It's all part of the important accounting process that uh, without it, um, we have other partners and stakeholders who would be kind of looking over our shoulders wondering, well, whose water is that that's being delivered to those outfalls? So, um, the photo you see on the left is some brand new infrastructure that just went in this winter that belongs to the San Francisco outfall, which is our southernmost outfall in the Isleta Reach. Those are brand new solar powered automated slide gates that will allow us to um, determine uh, level condition and actual flow condition to the outfall. Uh, it will also allow for remote um, adjustment if necessary. And the, the photo you see on the right is our northernmost uh, outfall in the Isleta Reach. That's the Alejandro Wasteway. And uh, same principle there. You've got slightly different gates, but the idea being you have good consistent measurement, which means you can then have good consistent delivery of these very small flows, usually on the order of two to five cubic feet per second is all that's needed to really maintain these sites. So how do we get water to these outfall sites? What's the program and the mechanism by which we generate flow uh, that can then be delivered to these sites? Well, Paul already talked about um, the water that he has leased and that Audubon has leased through uh, San Juan. Chama with, with uh, other partners there. Well, the MRGCD went about creating our very own environmental water leasing program using grant funding that was provided by National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and, and Bureau of Reclamation. And it's a voluntary opportunity for interested irrigators to temporarily fallow their land. Uh, we've offered this on a partial season as well as a full season before. Um, in 2019, it was our, our very first pilot, so we started off very small and have been slowly stepping up to meet the demand that we have at these outfalls. 
uh, that demand is also tried to try to pair that with uh, the river conditions that we expect for the year. So if we have a, a bumper snowpack and we don't anticipate uh, substantial drying in, in the river because we have storage up north and are able to maintain flows as well as our diversions, then, then what we plan on leasing for the year to uh, provide a supplemental support to these outfall sites is going to be less than take a year such as the one we're in where we're looking at a, a less than optimal snowpack and no ability to store up north due to some, some compact and, uh, uh, and construction limitations on our facility right now. So that means we need to do more to support these outfall sites uh, during the peak of irrigation season, which is when we typically see the river drying in these letter reach. Um, so this is a very adaptive program. Um, there's, there's no long-term plan to, uh, to buy and dry farmland. We see this as a rotationary program where farmers kind of rotate their fields in and out of the program, take the per acre compensation to make improvements, um, buy new seed, contact us about other infrastructure improvements. And then once that field is done with enrollment for the year, they can go back into productive agriculture in that field. This is a photo by uh, Quinn Martin over at Audubon, by the way, this is uh, the same outfall that we've been showcasing in Paul's uh, presentation. This is the Los Chavez. As you can see here, it's actually uh, got water backing up from the river. This is early in the year, um, probably during the middle of, of one of our um, peak runoffs. Quick satellite view of where these outfalls are located inside the Isleta Reach. So got Alejandro Wasteway up there to the north, um, track your way all the way down to the south where the San Francisco outfall sits right at the confluence of the Rio Puerco and the Rio Grande. And uh, you know, again, these, these projects will be kind of scaled to meet the, the demand that we anticipate uh, for every single year. So again, if we have a great year, we don't anticipate a, a whole lot of drying in the reach, the number of outfalls we might plan to utilize um, you know, could be reduced. Whereas in a, a year like this, if we have substantial leasing enrollment and um, have a, a really nice credit to, to the water account to make those deliveries, we would consider increasing the number of outfalls that we support uh, to maintain channel connectivity throughout the year, throughout the middle valley. This is a summary of what we've done so far in our, our leasing program. Again, in, in 2020, this is a, a very small pilot program. We started off with uh, 10 irrigators, and uh, with 10 irrigators, we got 260 acres enrolled at $150 per acre. Um, and from there, we've, we've just continued to add um, different elements to that program. In 2021, we offered a full season and a partial season that allowed for a little bit more diversification of farmer uh, to come in and enroll if they had a winter crop that they wanted to finish off before enrolling partial season allowed them to irrigate for uh, the first couple months of the irrigation season and then uh, fallow that field for the remainder. Um, really nice showing last year with 44 irrigators enrolled and 721 acres uh, acquired into the program for, for last year. And last year we delivered uh, a little less than 1,600 acre feet uh, to all those outfalls in support of, of the mill. This year's a, a pretty big step up and we're Kind of in the throes of enrollment right now. In 2022, we have a, a leasing objective of about 14,000 acres. Interestingly, this is a, a combined program that is trying not only to support the outfalls, but also have uh, basic demand reduction to support our compact um, obligations, or I should say the state's compact obligations. And we are actively looking to enroll about 10,800 acres just for demand reduction. Uh, while the remaining 3,200 acres would go towards supporting uh, the strategic outfalls. And I'll take any questions that um, the group has, so I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Paul and Casey. Um, it's super cool to hear about all the amazing work y'all done and all the really great pictures that you um, both included and really appreciate that helps illustrate uh, what's really happening on the ground. Um, we've had a couple questions come in. 
Um, I think uh, a couple of them came in at the beginning of your presentation, Casey. So maybe I'll direct these to you to start. Uh, Max Smith asked, can you describe the San Juan Chama leasing process? Whose water rights are you purchasing and how are you storing the water? You know, since it's it's Audubon who's actually contracting with the San Juan Chama, I'm gonna let Paul uh, tackle that one. Yeah, so, uh, so just to be clear, the environmental water leasing program that Casey described that the district is undertaking is actually doing these temporary uh, leases of water from farms, for fouling farms, um, but, but temporary. So it's a really important point that Casey made is that that's not, we're not looking for buy and drive. We're really we're keeping the ag alive is critical. But so separate from that is the San Juan Chama water. And that's what Audubon, the water that Audubon has been able to lease. And we've been leasing these through some municipalities, a partnership with munis municipalities. Um, and uh, this is a year by year, Situ but we do have we do have funding through 2027 an agreement through 2027, but it's been working with these municipalities and um, they've been yeah so I mean just a, a lease process with them. I should say that you know, the district does have our own allocation of, of San Juan Chama, um, but the the purpose for that is is really for irrigation irrigation deliveries, um, but yeah we do receive a an allocation, kind of a pro rata allocation based on what the entire allocation of San Juan Chama for, for the state of New Mexico is on a, on an annual basis. Got it, thank you both. Um, the next question was, uh, someone was curious or wanted to ask it, where the MRGCD budget comes from. Sure, so, um, to date, the conservation program has been strictly funded through uh, grants that we've been awarded. Um, we currently are running off of a grant that was awarded to us by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, it's actually administered by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and was awarded through the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and we are looking for um, future funding opportunities and partners to kind of uh, continue to get these programs up and off the ground. And the MRGCD is also looking to probably fund in part some of these programs long-term uh, through our own budget. Great, thank you. Um, the next question was uh, from Martha Cooper. Is the 14,000 acre goal for 2022 for both split and full season leases? That's a good distinction for this season. Um, because we're going to be using a combination of federal and state funding uh, for this year, we, we did away with the partial season uh, for this year. Partial season is, has its advantages, um, but there is kind of a diminishing return on, on a lot of the partial season, especially when you're thinking about uh, demand reduction, and especially in a, in a year where we're not anticipating a whole lot of uh, natural flow to be in the system anyway. Um, so the, the program for this year is focusing strictly on full season enrollment of, of applicants for a total of 14,000 acres. That's what we're prepared to accept into the program. Great, thanks Casey. And a few other questions, um, two from Sid Webb. The first question was just, what is Wasteway? Uh, yeah, Wasteway is a, is a term that when I first started at the MRGCD, I, I kind of had to do a double take on it as well. Um, wasteway is, is a, just a term of phrase that refers to the, the facility uh, by which water is returned back to the river. Um, it's also called an outfall or um, a river return. So uh, wasteway, outfall, river return, they're, they're all the same thing. And I think what's a, predominantly is used when, when you have excess water mm -hmm. in the facility, right? If, if you have heavy monsoons and you need to relieve pressure you know, through the facility, you need to waste that water back to the river. Uh, that's why it has that name. Yeah, I was just going to make that distinction. That's great. It, it, that, that it was, these were designed for high flows, for big storms. 
and they're currently being used predominantly. They're still being used for the high flows needed for those relief valves, but but they're being used for low flow. And I just also wanted to something say something else is that the the water itself. We're talking about these water that we're either leasing from municipalities or from farmers themselves. Um, it's only being charged when lows flows get in the river to a critically low period. I just wanted to mention that as well. So when when the river starts going intermittent, then it's considered consumptive use. But prior to that, um, it's not. Just I don't know if that makes sense, but we're just that distinction. I wanted to make that as well. No, that's I'm glad you brought that up, Paul. Yeah, the the accounting procedure, you know, that we agreed to this this last year with our partners is is just like Paul mentioned when uh, we use a specific river gauge. Um, located at the top of the Isleta Reach. And when that river gauge drops below a certain CFS, um, that's when we start to anticipate river drying in the Isleta Reach. And that kind of triggers uh, the drawdown of whatever water the account has been credited uh, for the season. Um, as water, if we get big monsoon events that bump that flow gauge you know, back up above that on off trigger, uh, and the accounting basically pauses until river conditions either drop back down or you know, they stay the same and there's no additional crediting or uh, debiting of the account, I should say. Got it, thanks for those distinctions. Um, I think one other question we have in the chat right now, also from Sid, was how does MRGCD communicate with the US IBWC, which is the, for those who don't know, the US section for the International Boundary and Water Commission um, to the south? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know that I have a good answer. Um, you know, we, we work closely with the, with the ISC and, and the OSC to communicate our, our um, water operations and management here in the Middle Rio Grande Valley. And I'm sure those management decisions kind of get, get trickled into um, the, the greater management decisions that the OSC and ISC uh, Interstate Stream Commission have in, in general. So. Um, I could try and answer that uh, off channel if if uh, Sid would like, but I don't have a good answer for him right now on that one. All right. Does anyone else have other questions to drop in the chat or also feel free to turn off your videos, unmute yourselves and just ask out loud. Paul, Casey, any final take home points you want to make or final thoughts, things you want to really drive home? I, I, I mean, just that this is, to me, is a, a very forward thinking program that the Conservancy District is developing. Um, and it's one that is, you know, alongside doing irrigation efficiency is looking at keeping the river alive. And I just really want to Big shout out to the Conservancy District for their work in doing this. And echoing what, what Paul said, and I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I think we've come to come to find at the MRGCD that being proactive about how we manage the river for species and how we um, manage our demand for compact compliance and, and keep those in perspective when we you know make those diversions for for agriculture. Um, long term is, is a much better way forward than uh, just managing for agriculture and hoping that compact compliance and you know, endangered species keep up, right? We, we need to find a way to make sure that our decisions are, um, are sustainable. So what we're seeing with this strategic outfall in, in the environmental water leasing program is that uh, in the grand scheme of things, a, a relatively small volume of water given the total volume that passes through the middle, the middle of the grand annually, uh, a rather small volume of water is, is really making a big impact on, on these habitat sites. And, and we've done some substantial uh, monitoring of these sites with, with, con with consultants um, to see what, the, uh, see what the minnows are doing in these sites at different parts of the year. And the results have been really promising. We're seeing uh, the minnow 
come into these areas when conditions in the main channel are no longer um, habitable, whether it's river drying or temperature thresholds. So I think what we're seeing is that there's a very high return on investment um, for these outfall sites long-term if we can just find ways to continue to fund them um, and, and make that funding a, a sustainable source. Uh, I'm very envious of Paul's uh, secured funding for, uh, for multiple years out. That's something that um, you know, I'm hopeful we can come, come to find a good way to do that for our recent program long-term. And that's part of the resilience here, right? That I've got in some water since 2027, you're developing this program, the beer reclamation. So, so again, speaking to having different folks in the game of doing these water leases, but also working directly with ag, you know, realizing that ag is keeping ag vital is just like a centerpiece to keeping the river vital in the middle of Rio. Um, so I just wanna, so it's just, uh, you know, long-term we're not, you know, we're not 2030, 2027, you know, we'll sneeze and it'll be 2027. So, we, um, but it's great that all th these are being worked on and it's like, it's actively uh, being developed and strategies are for keeping the river alive. Great, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you both. Um, and a couple other questions came in during that. Uh, one other one from Martha Cooper uh, who said, they're curious about how ag producers have responded to this program. Uh, what can be learned about how to do effective outreach to find ag partners interested in following? And do you think you'll reach that 14,000 uh, 14, following goal? Well, farmers have, have reacted um, kind of all across the, the spectrum, right? And we've conducted some, some post enrollment surveys to try and understand uh, more about the farmers who did enroll and the farmers who didn't enroll. You know, what were the reasons for either opting in or opting out? And a lot of it comes down to where they're at in their crop rotations um, at any given time. If you have a farmer who's got a, a brand new field of alfalfa that's you know, one to two years old, uh, a high yield crop that is um, not yet reached the, the, the peak of its potential earnings for that, for that landowner, right? So, so that particular landowner in that particular field is not necessarily a good candidate for our program, specifically because we are trying to target um, property that is on the margin, right? So we want that farmer who's got the seven or eight year old alfalfa field that's starting to get weeds, doesn't produce like it like it did five five years ago, um, and the farmers you know really needs to turn that field over. Uh, but still wants to make a little bit of something on that property. That's the field that we're trying to target with our, with our per acre payments. Um, now we, we've moved away from that a little bit this year, just because of the infusion of state funding uh, that we have for the program. And because we are trying to pair uh, the environmental water leasing program with this demand reduction emergency following program that is focused more on compact deliveries. And we are starting to offer a, a price per acre that's, a little more attractive to, to a farmer, even if they've got a relatively new alfalfa field. Um, and again, that's something that we plan on adapting depending on where we're at with compact compliance um, and, and where we're at with snowpack. But you know, the, the, I guess the short answer for um, the question is that we've heard from farmers that say, this is a great program. Uh, I took the money that you guys provided me and I put in a concrete farm ditch, or I put in a pipe system, or I bought new seed, um, or I took a vacation. <laughs> you know that they. So we've also heard on the on the far side of, of the other side of the spectrum that um, you know, farmers think the MRGCD should be simply focused on farming, and I can understand that that point of view, um, but it's it's a little bit simplistic and it, it ignores the reality of. Of how the middle of your grand is, is managed. And because the MRGCD is in the middle of all of these pieces, you know, getting those compact deliveries down to Elephant Butte, um, helping to manage the river for endangered species, and also having a, a really robust you know, agricultural sector, uh, doing just agriculture uh, is, is it's not really realistic for us anymore. Great. And that 
connects to another question that somebody dropped. Uh, if you, they had asked if you have seen much crop switching taking place in the district, and what crops are folks switching to when they're tired of their alfalfa field and they're looking for something new. We're seeing a lot of people transition into what we call shoulder season crops. Uh, those are crops that people try and start in the fall or early in the spring and get done before um, water constraints really get, get tight in the middle of the summer. So a, a lot of that is a combination of rye and barley, uh, peas, things like that. Um, but still the majority of what we're seeing is, is new planting of uh, rotationary forage crop. So permanent pasture, hay, alfalfa, Great, thank you. Um, and maybe I'll make this our last question. Um, one more question from Sid. Is there much groundwater extraction by agriculture in the MRGC? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, it's, it's a growing, it's a growing sector of, of how we, um, of how our farmers irrigate their property. I wouldn't say it's the, the predominant. I think we still um, easily deliver more surface uh, for surface water to our irrigators than they pump. Um, but that being said, we have noticed a, a considerable shift in the number of groundwater wells uh, for agriculture that are being drilled, the number of water rights that are being you know, moved into those wells. Um, and there, there is some concern within the district on that because, you know, at the end of the day, you can kind of avoid a lot of the natural shortage sharing that exists in surface water delivery if you have a well um, because you're able to tap you know, groundwater that is that's there consistently um, and we also see some some losses in how we're able to convey water uh, down the river if you've got additional groundwater pumping um, but yeah we are seeing a little bit more of that and it's it's a way for farmers to kind of uh, ensure their investment and you know, I, I understand the value in it, absolutely. My, my hope is that we can find a, a good way to manage both that surface water and that groundwater conjunctively in a way that doesn't um, you know, extinguish or diminish one or the other. Great. Well, thank you, Casey and Paul, so much uh, for taking the time to join us and everyone else who attended this webinar. Um, as Genevieve just dropped that link, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the CCAS YouTube channel, uh, probably within a week, um, where you can also find all our previous webinars. If you enjoyed learning about this case, this case study, this work um, that they, that Paul and Casey have been involved in that we've developed into a case study and Genevieve also dropped that link, I encourage you to visit CCAS and check out all the other case studies on our dashboard where we currently have 134 and is quickly growing by the day. Um, we're working on lining up webinar speakers for the coming months. Please contact us if you would like to receive the webinar announcements, but you're not yet on our mailing lists. Um, finally, again, again, we thank you all for your time and thank you so much, Paul and Casey, for joining us and giving this excellent presentation. We hope you all have a great rest of your Tuesday.